Hey, hey, welcome back to another episode of the Girl Be Free podcast. I'm your host, Siobhan, where I'm going to inspire and motivate you to show up for yourself. Today, I am super excited because I have my first ever guest on the show to talk about a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. Today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Joy Bradford. She's a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia, and her goal is to help you become the best version of yourself. She's also the founder of Therapy for Black Girls, which y'all know I talk about that website all the time on here. And she's been featured on O Magazine, Essence, Bustle, Woman's Health, She Knows, and The Washington Post. I feel like she's the go-to for everything therapy. So again, I'm very excited to have her on the show. Dr. Joy, welcome so much to the Girl Be Free podcast. And before we get started, I do want to say that this is strictly for educational purposes. So if you need a therapist in your area, definitely go to therapyforblackgirls.com and search their directory, put in your zip code, and then that way you can find a professional in your area. So as again, um, Dr. Joy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Siobhan. I'm very excited. I am too, like over the moon excited, especially with this being my, you being my first guest. So thank you for being on the show. So if you can tell our listeners just a little bit about who you are and why you created Therapy for Black Girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you shared quite a bit in the introduction. Um, but I created Therapy for Black Girls really as as a place for us to have a space to talk about mental health topics that were relevant and accessible for black women and girls. Um, so I think a lot of times when we think about like mental health, we maybe only think about things like depression and anxiety or, um, you know, maybe some of the well, well, more well-known kinds of things, but there's so much to talk about in terms of mental health and mental wellness. So I really wanted therapy for black girls to kind of be the space where people come to get that kind of information. And I feel like that's exactly what it is. I, every time that I'm speaking or I'm having an event or someone is looking for a therapist, I'm always sending them your way. And I feel like you've done a really great job with creating this platform so that you have become like the go-to for all things therapy. So thank you so much for creating the platform um, because it's so, as you know, it's so necessary. And so I wanted to have you on the show because as I've mentioned on previous episodes, I, I wanted to have a conversation around unhealthy mother-daughter relationships. And of course, I have my own mother wounds that stem from when I was a child that I am still working through myself. And so recently, I had an episode called The Motherless Child. And Dr. Joy, there were, I received so many responses and stories from women who were basically suffering. Um, and you would never know by just looking at their feet or anything like that, but they had a lot of mother wounds. And so I created the Motherless Child Guidebook to offer support, um, a sacred space for healing your mother wounds to kind of give them an, a resource to kind of help them work through that. But then I also want to have a conversation with you, a licensed psychologist, to kind of answer some of these deeper questions that I cannot answer, that I am not equipped to answer. But I wanted to have you on the show to just to help and give um, a professional background and kind of help women work through this. So we're going to go through the questions that I've already sent you. And the well, before we start, Siobhan, I just want to say, um, you know, and I know we've kind of talked about this off air as well. I think I am not surprised that you got the kind of response that you got when you opened up um, the space for this kind of conversation, because I think the relationships, particularly between Black moms and daughters, um, like it is often something, if the relationship is not so good, it's not something that is like frequently talked about, right? And so I think sometimes there's a lot of shame, especially for daughters who feel like, okay, I could be doing something else to have a better relationship with my mom or whatever, um, because we're often taught that our mothers are to be revered, right? And, and a lot of times that comes at our own expense. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people struggle with relationships with moms, um, and we're not always given a healthy space to talk about these kinds of things. So I'm really not shocked that you got the kind of response that you got when you opened it up. Oh my goodness. I agree. Like there, it's so crazy because you know how we can see so many conversations about like the father not being in a home. And it's almost like that conversation has become comfortable. However, when it comes to talking about mama, it's like, absolutely mm -hmm. not. You know, she's put on this pedestal. And even me, like I carried a lot of shame for years because there was not conversation. There wasn't therapy for black girls when I was like, a teenager, obviously, and even in my 20s. And I suffered a lot. And I felt like I was the only person going through what I was going through. And then now I'm seeing 
you know, obviously more people are talking about mental wellness, which is fantastic. But as far as this conversation about mother wounds, like I feel like maybe the can is just being opened. Um, and hopefully this can stir up a little bit more conversation so people don't feel like they're the only ones that's going through what they're going through and they can start their healing process. Right. All right. So the first question that we got in, it says, how to feel responsible to, or how do I feel responsible to develop a healthy relationship now after it's been unhealthy? I get guilted by my family to do, to do more, but most don't know what it feels like being behind closed doors. How would your response be for this person who has an unhealthy relationship with their mother, but they feel guilted by their family that they're supposed to do more? Yeah, I think, you know, families are often really big perpetrators of this, right? Like wanting to guilt you into doing something. Um, And I think it goes back to just what we talked about before, like just this idea about what our relationship should be like with our moms and other people in our family. Um, And so, you know, I think often that comes from a good place, but I don't think that people understand the impact that that has on somebody who has really struggled with their relationship with their mom. Um, You know, so just because it is your mom, if it is not a healthy relationship, if it's not reciprocal, if you've done, you know, lots of different things to try to, you know, establish good boundaries and to kind of rationalize with mom and help her see things from your perspective, a lot of times people have done all they can do and so they are continuing to suffer Mm -hmm. because other people think that they should be continuing in this relationship with mom or letting her say anything to you. And the truth is that that is just not okay. It's not okay even if it's mom for somebody to, you know, constantly be picking you apart and demoralizing you and talking down to you and just saying any kind of thing or behaving any kind of way with you it's just not okay. And so sometimes you have to set very firm boundaries with mom and with other family members that it's okay for you to do what you need to do to protect your own peace and your sanity. And sometimes that means um, you have to have further, um, put more distance between you and mom. So maybe you still have a relationship with her, but it's kind of like a check-in as needed kind of thing, as opposed to something that may be closer. And sometimes people decide that they can't have any kind of relationship because those boundaries continue to be manipulated and crossed. And so for their own best interest, they decide to no longer even have a relationship. And so usually people who have made those decisions have gone through you know, trying to do all kinds of things to try to honor the relationship and mom just is not kind of sticking to those boundaries. And so they make the decision then to not have a relationship at all. And I think a lot of family members kind of only on the outside looking in think you could be doing more when the truth of it is that you likely have done all that you can and that you've now made the decision that is in your best interest. Oh, and that, look, I'm over here not in my head, like, oh, that is so good, because family will do that, and they love to use the scripture, like, honor thy father and thy mother, and it's like, but what if your mother is not honoring you, and what right. if there's the relationship is so toxic that it's impossible to really be there, to be present when there's nothing there to begin with. Um, I know my mother and I, you know, she was emotionally unavailable for me. And so now we do have an unhealthy, strained relationship, if you will. Like we can be cordial and we see each other and speak and all that jazz, but that's as far as it goes. And I've come to terms through therapy that I have to love her where she's at and keep it pushing and not allow other people to make me feel like I should be doing something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And And that's, I think, I think that's the hard part for people to get to, right? Is that there will be so many other people who will try to guilt you into thinking that you don't need to do the thing that is best for you, but you probably have weighed all of the options. And, you know, when you make that decision, then it's usually at great length. Absolutely. And I, another question, it's not listed on here, but it came up. Someone had asked me, was it okay to put distance between um, your mother and you? Like, is that okay? And my answer was absolutely. Like, if the relationship is unhealthy and you feel like it's preventing you from growing, then I don't think that personally, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. And then everything happens in season. So there may be a time like right now, you just have to be put distance until you go through therapy and all that jazz. And then maybe it'll come back around where it'll be better for you guys. But I don't personally, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Sometimes there needs to be distance there. 
Awesome. Okay. Number two is how did you find what well, the question came in is how did you find closure on your own without getting acknowledgement from your mom? I feel like that was directed towards me. Um, and, and maybe you can kind of add on to this, but for me, I found closure through going to therapy and realizing because my mother has a mental illness along with some other things, I had to accept that I wouldn't get the apology or the acknowledgement that I needed and that was totally okay, that I couldn't allow that to prevent me from growing and moving forward. That has what works best for me. Um, of course, you know, maybe you can add something else as it relates to closure, but I just knew in my heart of hearts that she did the best that she could with what she had and that if I stay stuck in that mindset of waiting for her to apologize and acknowledge all the things that she did or didn't do, then that would prevent me from growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would agree with you, Siobhan. Um, you know, I think when we think about closure, we often think that it will come from someone or something else, when truly closure comes from us making, making peace with the reality as it is. So usually this attempt for closure is really a, a grief kind of process where we're having to let go of the idea of what we thought this would have been. So the idea of who I, I thought my mother would have been or the relationship I thought we would have had together. Um, and closure is really about the fact that as much as I wanted to have that, that's not the reality of my life. And so how can I support myself? What kinds of things can I put in place to support me in establishing a new reality? How do I grieve the loss of what I hope this relationship would be? And how can I continue to move forward? You know, and then there's nothing wrong with like holding out hope that at some point things may change, but it's also important for you to be taking care of yourself in the here and now. And so if that relationship can't if you know if the relationship with your mother cannot be healthy and supportive for you in the way that you need it to be it's okay to figure out okay what can I do now to take care of myself and maybe put some distance there so that you know I can kind of give myself what I need in terms of taking care of myself in the here and now and you know what that's one of the things that I talked about with my therapist I was holding on to the idea of what I thought my mother should be Mm -hmm. and not realizing that she could never be this idea. So here in my mind, I want to Claire Huxtable, you know, or Vivian from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And that wasn't my ideal situation. And so as we worked through that, like my therapist had me write down like everything that I thought a mother should be. And then write down, you know, the experience that I currently had with her and then releasing myself from that idea. So then that way I can have closure. And that did come with a lot of grief because it's accepting what is my reality and being okay as I move forward. Mm -hmm. I love that you said that. Yeah. So the next question that came in is how do you deal with your mother who was emotionally neglectful, but is very defensive when anything slightly critical gets brought up? Yeah. So I think that that is another case of um, like you talked about earlier, kind of expecting something from your mother when she's never shown you anything different, right? You know, so you can't expect that she will not be defensive or, you know, be able to kind of meet you emotionally in a conversation when she's never shown you that she can do that before. And so unless mom does some of her own work, maybe through therapy or through other things to kind of be able to handle maybe some very difficult conversations, you should expect that you're always going to get that kind of a response from her. And so if she's not going to change, then you need to then change your reaction and maybe relationship to her. So maybe that means, you know, not having these kinds of, um, conversations where you're expecting her to give you some kind of an answer because she's never done that before. So there's no reason for you to think unless she does some work on herself that she will be able to give you a different kind of a response. So I think that this is another case of, you know, having to look at your own expectations in terms of what you can get back from mom and maybe changing those. Mm -hmm. And that's why I created the motherless child guidebook is because I and one of the things that I point out in the guidebook is like, this is not your mother's journey. This is your journey. And so whether she never changes and she always stays the same, that's on her. But when you start doing your healing work, then you can start to accept her for who she is. And hopefully you will be able to grow and go through your own process and not again, going back to the other question, needing acknowledgement or some type of apology. 
Um, but I think sometimes people feel like when they're on the journey, they think their mother is supposed to change too, but she's not mm -hmm. doing the work that you're doing. Like she's not, you know, listening to the podcast or going to therapy or doing any of that. And so the expectation for her to change is something that you're hoping for, but she's not doing that work. Right. And the truth is that she may change, right? Because when we change, then the systems around us change, mm -hmm. but not always for the best, right? So, <laughs> you know, sometimes we change because we're working on ourselves and getting healthier and making, um, you know, stronger decisions. And the people in our lives who are resistant to that want to try to pull back from that or pull mm -hmm. us back from that. And so you may see some changes in her as you're changing, but they may not be for the best. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's really good because I never thought of it from that perspective. This episode of the Girl Be Free podcast is sponsored by the Motherless Child Guidebook, a sacred space for healing your mother wounds. There may be times in your life where you feel like a motherless child, whether your mother has passed away or you have an unhealthy, strained, toxic relationship with your mother and at times you feel motherless. In this guidebook, I am helping you identify the toxic mother patterns that you should be aware of, how to define what a mother wound is and how that wound is showing up in everyday life, how to reparent and mother your inner child, and then also how do you learn how to retell your story, create a new narrative, so that way you're no longer revisiting the negative energy that comes along with your pain. Plus, you're going to find a plethora of bonuses from soul writing prompts, a curated music playlist, affirmations that you can download and listen to whenever you are, a podcast series, a book list with additional resources to help support you on your journey, and over 90 minutes of video content that supports the guidebook to help you on your journey. Invest in your healing today because I am making space for you so that you feel seen, you feel acknowledged, and you know that you're not the only one dealing with sometimes feeling like a motherless child. Go to themotherlesschild.com. Again, the website is themotherlesschild.com. Uh -huh. uh, let's see. The next question is, how do you deal with a mother that is jealous of her daughter and don't want to see her happy with friends or companionship? It sounds crazy, but I truly don't understand why she feels that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... I think that this probably happens more often than people recognize. Um, and again, I think this is one of those conversations that we kind of maybe are having in secret or don't let people know that this is happening. And so we're, we don't realize how common it is. Um, but it is not uncommon for there to be some jealousy in mother-daughter relationships coming from mom. Um, especially, you know, if there have been things in mom's childhood where she got stuck yes. in some way, mm -hmm. um, you know, so if there's a history of abuse or, um, you know, like maybe she got pregnant young or something happens where maybe her life doesn't kind of develop in the ways that she thought that she, it would, then it's not uncommon for there to be some tension when the daughter gets to that place in her life. And so, you know, sometimes, Moms are afraid that if you get too close to these other people, there will not be space for them in your life. Um, sometimes they are reacting out of their own insecurities, their own wishes and, and fears about what their lives have been or what they hoped it would have been. And so this jealousy thing can come up. And so mom won't often maybe even recognize it as a jealousy kind of thing, but it is something that you might pick up on as a daughter. Like, oh, every time you talk about a certain kind of friend, she rolls her eyes or, you know, that kind of thing. And so sometimes that can happen. Um, and it is usually an indication of something kind of unresolved, unworked through in mom's life and not really at all an indication of anything that you actually have going on in your life as the daughter. And, you know, I've seen that happen in my own relationship because my grandmother raised me. And mm -hmm. I remember from when I was young, my mother, my mother, my grandmother have always had a quite interesting um, relationship. And my mother is the baby. And so with that, she always felt like, you know, my grandmother I think that there was a little jealousy of the relationship that I had with my grandmother versus with her. And so she would make little comments and I never thought too much of it because obviously I was a child, but now being an adult, I'm like, oh, that makes sense why she would say that because she felt a sense of jealousy. Now, would she ever vocalize that? Probably not, but 
now me being a mature adult, I totally understand it and I see it. And now my grandmother and my mother have a much better relationship because my mother is doing better now for her, which is good. But I definitely saw that in our relationship growing up as well. So I, I agree, like that's not something that's un seen like it's probably more common than not where mothers have that jealousy towards their daughter but obviously they're not going to necessarily acknowledge that yeah and i and i don't even know that it's not acknowledging i don't even know that they always see it right because you know they're just kind of acting out um their trauma so to speak yeah. and so a lot of times when that happens the people around you see that and it's not necessarily something that you um, can maybe put your finger on for yourself, especially if you're not like doing therapy and, you know, some self-reflection, like you don't always see how you're behaving towards others. Um, and Dr. Pam Thompson wrote a book called Surviving Mom. I'm not sure if you checked this one out, Siobhan, um, okay. but she talks a lot about this in her book, this like jealousy that can sometimes come up between mom and daughter. Um, so that would probably be an excellent resource for anybody else who's wanting to um, kind of read more and kind of think through what this looks like in their lives. It's called Surviving Mama by Dr. Pam Thompson. Oh, thank you so much for that. I'll make sure that I link to that in the show notes so people can check that out as well. And no, I never heard of it. So I'm going to have yeah. to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You will enjoy that one then. Yes. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay. So the next one we have is how do we not follow the same patterns of unhealthy behavior passed down by family members? For example, selfishness, unemotional connections, specifically for moms and dads. But since we're talking about moms, we'll just keep it there. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're already on the good first step, which is recognition that this is happening, right? So when you can recognize a pattern that has happened, you can do a better job of not falling into it. I'm um, not saying that that's automatic, but at least you have some awareness of the ways that you would not like to behave. Um, so I think that that's the first step. Um, and then the second step, I think, is some therapy, probably combined with some journaling. Um, you know, so to, to really be reflective and intentional about like how you show up in relationships, um, being open to feedback from people, you know, but not getting so paranoid that you're going to like become this thing that you then like sabotage your relationships or like are weird some way in the relationships so I think it, it really is a very fine balance of like awareness but not it becoming paranoia so re allowing yourself to show up authentically in relationships but but being pay being attentive to your behavior and open to feedback from people about how you are showing up in those relationships and see, so I showed up in the extreme side. So everything that my mother was, I was mentally competing with her to not be, mm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So she didn't graduate high school. I made sure that I graduated. I made sure that I got married before kids. I made sure that I went on to get my bachelor's. A bachelor's wasn't good enough. I had to make sure I had to get a master's because I wanted to make sure that I can prove to myself that I was smart enough. And everything that I felt like, I guess I didn't like, or that caused some type of strain in our relationship, I had to be 10 times better. The crazy thing is she wasn't competing with me. It was me competing with her internally. And it was killing me because everything that I did, nothing was good enough because I still had the mother wounds. And this was all pre-therapy. And so every time I thought once I got to this level of success in my mind, then I would be okay. And in actuality, I was just really hurting myself because I was competing with someone who I wasn't like in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it took me going to therapy to realize that I was only hurting myself and I really had to show up and practice healthy behaviors and competing with her and trying not to be her was definitely not the answer. And then I remember also maybe a couple of weeks ago, there was this lady who walked up to me at an event and I was speaking on a panel and she was watching my social media feed. And she said, I noticed you've been talking a lot about mother wounds. She said, I have my own mother wounds. And she said, everything that I did not want to repeat that my mother did, I did the exact thing with my daughter and now I'm trying to figure out how to fix it. So it can happen on two different ends of the spectrum mm -hmm. where, you know, these unhealthy behaviors um, can be passed down. Yeah. And, you know, when you think about like living your life so much 
like so that you don't become someone else, then you really kind of miss on miss out on like who am I to begin yes. with, right? So you, everything is a reaction to what I don't want to be, as opposed to a real celebration and cultivation of who I actually am. Mm-hmm. So it is something that you want to you know kind of pay some attention to, and like you said, when you recognize you're doing it, then you can do some work to kind of figure out like, okay, this probably is not the best way. This may not be the route I want to take in my life. How can I kind of undo some of this and go down a different path. Mm -hmm. And I think the eye-opening moment for me was, it was one day during my therapy session, it was group therapy that I was in. And we had a session. And then at the end, the young lady, when we were leaving, she was like, Siobhan, come here. And she was like, you know, you're nothing like your mother. And you never know who's paying attention or who's listening. And when she said that, that's when it hit me like, no, I'm nothing like her. And it's almost like I needed that reminder from someone on the outside looking in to say that to me, for me to kind of go within and start to practice healthy patterns. So that Mm -hmm. was really helpful. Yeah. Um, Okay. The next question is, what should someone who has never been to therapy look like, or excuse me, look for in a therapist? And is there any pre-work that should be done for those who are new to going to therapy? Oh, good. Great question. (laughs) Um, So I think when you are looking for a therapist, you want to keep in mind what kinds of things are going to be important to you. Um, So for a lot of people, finances are going to be a big part of that. So um, if you're wanting to find someone who accepts your insurance, if you kind of have a budget in mind in terms of like how much you are able to afford on for therapy a month, like that may be something that you want to keep in mind. So if you're looking for someone who accepts your insurance, then you may want to get a list from your insurance company about therapists in your area who are covered so that you don't like do all this research and like think you found the perfect therapist for you and then you realize they don't accept your insurance. I know that can be really frustrating for people. So I typically encourage you that if you know you're going to want to use your insurance and you know have a copay or whatever, then get a list from your insurance company first to kind of start that search. The other thing is that you want to make sure that you find a therapist who has a specialization in whatever is bringing you to therapy. So if you are struggling with an anxiety disorder um, or depressive disorder or substance abuse, you want to make sure that the therapist that you find has a specialization in that. So most of us are kind of trained as generalists kind of through master's programs and PhD programs and that kind of thing. But we often will Um, do special programs and certifications and things beyond graduation so that we have a specialty area in um, whatever we choose. And so it would be in your best interest to find somebody who does have a specialization in that so that you have a better chance of, you know, getting the kind of results that you want and making the kind of changes you want to make in your life by working with that person. I also think it's really important to make sure that you find somebody who you think you will feel comfortable talking with. And so sometimes that means finding somebody who matches you in terms of culture, gender, sexual orientation, identity, all of those kinds of things may be important to you, but it is really important for you to find somebody who you will feel comfortable talking with. So it doesn't matter how many letters I have behind my name and how many specialties I have. If I make you feel uncomfortable and you feel like you can't really open up to me in the therapy office, then it's not going to be a good match. So you do really want to make sure that you kind of look through people's websites. Um, Most times when when you're starting to work with a therapist, you can do like a 10 to 15 minute consultation with them on the phone to ask them more questions, get a better sense of, you know, their personality and kind of get any concerns you have cleared up. So I do think that's important too, is to make sure that you find somebody who you think, at least in the beginning, you will feel comfortable talking with. Um, The thing is though, I think again, where people would sometimes get frustrated is that sometimes you can do all of that work and you get to the office and it just is not a click, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. just like, oh, I thought I would have liked this person, but you go to a couple of sessions and you realize you're not um, maybe opening up as much as you want or you feel judged in some way or, you know, something is happening. And so every therapist is not going to be the best fit for you. Um, You know, so I know, again, that can be frustrating because you're like, oh, I just opened up to this person. Now I got to do all of this again. Um, And that may be frustrating, but you owe it to yourself to find the therapist who is going to be a great match for you in terms of like really creating a space that feels comfortable for you to share. And that was really helpful for me. I remember my first session, I went um, 
before I went to the final session or what have you, it was a lady that, and I just don't think we connected at all. Um, and I know in my life at the time, my friend, she was getting married. And so we were planning for that. And I don't know if I was all the way in, even though I knew I needed to deal with like the mother wounds and all that jazz. And so after three sessions, I felt like I was just talking and I just didn't feel like we were going anywhere. So I stopped seeing her. And then later on that year, I still felt like I needed something. And so I went to my church and they had a group called Healing the Mother Wounds. And it was perfect for what I needed. And it was group therapy, which I was kind of hesitant about that at first. But the beautiful thing about that was that everybody there was there because they had mother wounds. So I felt a sense of connection and a sense of family where I wasn't the only one going through what I was going through. We were all there together. And even though it was group, a lot of people got personalized and individual attention, if you will. And then also after the session was over, um, cause we were, I was in therapy for four months at that point, I ended up finding a therapist who was over that particular group and started working with her one-on-one. And so I love how you said like, just because the first person is not a good fit, that doesn't mean that you stop going, finding a therapist. You just find someone that's a good fit for you until you have that perfect match. Yeah, absolutely. And then the other part of the question um, that I didn't quite address was the whole idea around pre-work for therapy. Um, So, you know, I think it's a good idea to kind of maybe think through like what kinds of things you're wanting to bring to the therapist. Um, Like, so what is really, what are you struggling with right now? How long has this been going on? Like that kind of thing. But you don't want to stress yourself out too much in terms of like preparing for that first session because the therapist will ask you a bunch of questions anyway. So your first couple of sessions um, are typically what we refer to as like the intake process where we're getting a lot of information from you about what's been going on, how long has it been going on, asking you a bunch of questions about your history and relationships and that kind of thing. So you want to maybe do a little bit of work in terms of thinking through like, okay, what do I want to talk about and like what might be my goals for therapy? But the therapist will also ask you a ton of questions. So if you you know, don't do a whole bunch of work on the front end, it's very likely that you'll still get to some of that because the therapist will ask you anyway. And let me ask another question around like finding a therapist. What if you're someone that's afraid because, you know, you've suppressed these feelings for so long and now bringing them to the forefront, it's a little bit of fear of what's going to come up when you start having these conversations. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Siobhan. Um, and I, I don't think that that's an abnormal fear, right? Especially, I often think about it as like that closet in your house that you shove all the junk in, like when company is coming over and you got to quickly throw some stuff in the closet, right? That closet that you just shove a whole bunch in. And when you finally open that closet, like all of this junk falls out, that can sometimes be what it feels like to go to therapy when you've kind of been shoving stuff away for some time. And so a part of the therapy process is also educating you on um, the fact that sometimes therapy will feel worse before it feels better and that we will likely be teaching you exercises so that you can kind of tolerate digging through all of this stuff that has fallen out so that you don't feel like you're going to fall apart just because now you've opened up all of this stuff. Um, So sometimes in therapy, we will kind of pace you, so to speak, so that you don't overwhelm yourself with like sharing everything that has come out of the closet. So, you know, we might find this one box that we can dig through a little bit at a time as opposed to ripping the lids off all the boxes at once and just dumping it all on the floor. So that a a part of that is also like the therapist kind of setting the frame for therapy to help you understand what it will look like. But I think that that's a very normal fear, like what is going to happen now that I finally deal with all of that stuff? And so the therapist will likely help you to kind of put some things in place so that you don't feel overwhelmed by that process. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Cause that crossed my mind. I'm like, Ooh, cause I know I, when I first, when I was very afraid because I didn't know what to expect and mm-hmm. nobody in my circle at the time was going to therapy, nor was it a conversation like it is today, like on social media and all that jazz. And so I was definitely afraid and even talking about something that's very, you know, triggering and very emotional. Like I didn't know what to expect. So thankfully, you know, I started out in like that group session. And when I started going to the same therapist um, on a one-on-one basis, it was like, we were just picking up where we left off. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. All right. So the next question is, how can you help your mother to heal and find closure and peace? 
I know what I could say for this, but <laughs> it's, it's your, you go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, so I think you have to be careful in terms of like what you're wanting to do in terms of helping your mother. Um, so I definitely think you can support mom, you know, if she has decided to go to therapy, you can be supportive. And if you're you know, in your own therapy, then you maybe can talk about that. Maybe you can do some joint sessions or something like that, but you cannot do mom's work for her. And so I'm not sure if this is what the, the question is getting at, but you can only kind of support and encourage mom. There's nothing that you can do to kind of give mom peace or closure or whatever if she's not doing her own work. So I, I, I would encourage you to be careful about that and kind of make sure that you're drawing clear lines around what is support and encouragement and what is you trying to like take all mom's issues and fix them for her if she's not doing the work absolutely I agree 110% <laughs> all right so our last question is more it's a question and it's a scenario all tied in one so I'll read the whole thing and we can kind of go from there um how do you forgive the mother who deliberately told a lie on your father and you believed it and then you lost years with your father behind it so I've been working on rebuilding a relationship with him, but my mother is also still alive. And sometimes I'm still angry about all the years that I lost with my father because of her and her lies. And yes, she did admit that she did it on purpose because I was close to him and she wanted him to suffer. And in turn, and in turn I suffered as well. Mm, yeah, that, there's a lot going on there. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully you are getting some support from a therapist to kind of work through all of this, because I think that that would be really important to have somebody to help you to kind of peel through all of the layers of what you're sharing. Um, and I think it's completely normal for you to be very angry about this. Um, you know, so I don't think that there is any misplaced anger. Like, I think you are rightfully angry that this has happened. Um, and it sounds like you are, you know, still trying to like now build this new relationship with your dad um, and still kind of be in this relationship with your mom and kind of balancing all of those things. And so I think um, working with the therapist to really kind of figure out like how you might be able to do those and not lose yourself in the midst of all of that would be really helpful. Um, but I, I want you to hear that your anger is appropriate and rightful. Um, and so, you know, you don't have to feel bad about that. Like you were gravely injured by this, you know, this lie that your mom told you. And so it's okay to be angry and upset about the fact that she did that. Mm -hmm. All of that. Yes. And I think sometimes that's something that we don't want to say is that we're angry, you know, about what happened to us. And so we kind of cover it up and kind of act like everything is normal when deep inside, like, yes, it is okay to be angry about things that happen that shouldn't have happened, you know? And so not to feel bad about being upset with your mom based on the choices that she made. But again, it is a solo journey. So you have to work on healing, like you said, through therapy to get to a better space so that she can they can all grow together, even if it um, takes a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. So one other thing that I want to ask, like, is there anything that you want to kind of, when we talk about like mother wounds and unhealthy mother-daughter relationships, like anything that you want to add that we didn't talk about today that will be helpful for the listeners? Ooh, I think we covered so much ground. I'm not thinking of anything that we really didn't kind of touch on. I think we kind of covered it. I feel the same. I just wanted to make sure if there was <laughs> yeah. anything from you that you wanted to add. So if you could just tell us anything exciting coming up for Therapy for Black Girls that we should know about, and then also let us know where we can find you and all that jazz. Um, nothing necessarily coming up, but stay tuned because there's always new information. Um, you know, so definitely check out the podcast. You know, we cover a range of different kinds of topics. So you can find that at therapyforblackgirls.com slash podcast. And like we talked about, if you are looking for a therapist, um, then our therapist directory would be a really great place to start. These are therapists across the country who love doing great clinical work with Black women and girls. So definitely check that out um, to see if you can find a therapist in your area to help you with whatever the journey is you're on in your life. Well, Dr. Joy, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for taking the time to share and give your professional um, expertise to my audience because I'm deeply, deeply grateful for that. And then also let us know where we can find you on social media. So for people that want to connect with you in other places. Yeah, you can connect with me personally at Hello Dr. Joy across all platforms. And then to stay connected to Therapy for Black Girls, you can find us at Therapy for Black Girls on both IG and Facebook. And then at Therapy for the number four B girls on Twitter. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And until next time, girl, be free.